in this, the last of the lesson of uh, Christian growth, we're going to be looking at the idea of authority. Now, authority is something that really impacts everyone, but um, a good majority of us really have no idea um, what it is, how we're supposed to respond about it. Especially in America, there's this kind of this this feeling that we are our own bosses, that uh, we'll, we want our voice to be heard. You know, you see it in everything. You see it in the way that people are constantly criticizing the president and stuff on social media. Rather than doing something with their life, they're wasting it criticizing someone else. Or in church conflicts, where instead of people getting involved in ministry, they give a bunch of a list of complaints to the pastor. They completely, completely misunderstand the idea of authority, the idea of service, the idea of love, the idea of the church. So let's look at um, at the purposes, or not not the purposes, but how we can detect a wrong attitude within us, how we can detect a wrong motivation, how we can detect a wrong action, and how we can detect wrong words. This is how God speaks to us. If you look on your sheet, first off, the Bible. God has a lot of stuff to say to us if we would only pick up our Bibles. And then, go, this is going from the top to the bottom. Think of this as, as a pyramid. The Bible, that's the tip of the pyramid. That's the first stop on the way down. Second is authority. The people that God has placed in your life. If you're a teenager, listen to your parents. Well, listen, honor your parents anyways, but if you're a teenager, listen to your parents. God will use them. Even if they are terrible parents, God will still use them. So don't use that excuse of, if my you don't understand my parents are terrible people. I, I, I'm not saying whether, whether your parents are great or not. I'm saying that God told you to honor them, and they are an authority in your life, and they do have something to teach you, even in their drunkenness. Just roll with me on this, okay? Um, another authority that we oftentimes overlook, judges and policemen. <laughs> I don't think that needs to be said any, anything more about that. Um, the pastor and church leadership, um, it's not the pastor's church, it's God's church. Um, so then, you know, the Bible, that's the chief way that God's going to talk to us. Then he's going to use, um, he's going to use, that test and then the authority test. Think of it as water seeping through uh, sand or something. You know, first it seeps through the Bible and then the authority. And so these things are going to match up when it's really God. Um, then our finances. <coughs> God's not going to tell you to do something that goes against his, the Bible and your authority, even if you have the finances for it. But assuming that the Bible agrees with, agrees with it, that your authority um, agrees with it, and you've gotten their advice on it, um, your finances agree with it, then that takes to peers. This is both friend and foe, people you do and do not like. What do they have to say about it? And uh, God will oftentimes use people to say things. I know that that stings and we don't like that. I don't like that person, God. You can't use them because I don't like them. But God will use them anyways. Um, and then the next stop on the scenic route to, finding, to, to hearing from God, prayer. You might think, prayer is a little low there. See, we pray for things like, God, give me patience, and then God brings in a near, an annoying person by to give us an opportunity to be patient. Um, next on down the list, circumstances. God will, God will use circumstances to speak to us. And then last, our conscience. See, we invert this, and we say, conscience first. If I feel like God is speaking to me, that must mean that God is speaking to me. And we ignore the Bible, we ignore our authorities, we ignore our finances, we ignore our peers, we ignore prayer, we ignore the circumstances, and we just say, I feel like this, so that means it is like this. Uh, so that, that brings us to three basic purposes for authority. And remember, God established authority. The first is to grow uh, wisdom and character, to make you smarter and wiser, and wisdom is shown in action and character, to grow in character, to make you a better person. God uses authority to change us. We don't like to be changed, and so it stings, and so our authority does something that we don't like, and we let them know, hey, I don't like that. I don't like that. Uh, the second reason, that uh, or basic purpose for authority, to gain protection from destructive temptations, God uses authority um, as a way to... Um, give us protection. Rebellion subjects us to Satan's realm and power. And if you read in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, he says, rebellion is like the sin of, a sin of witchcraft. So remember that. Uh, 
if you rebel against your authority, that's basically the the exact same thing as you know uh, practicing witchcraft, using a Ouija board, um, uh, you know. Uh, partaking of occultic activity with the candles and the animals and all that nonsense. And then the third uh, basic purpose for authority is to receive clear direction for life decisions, to know what you should do and accomplish his will. Well, I think that I should do this. Did you run it by authority? Did you ask them what they thought? So there's four basic structures of authority, and I gave you a lot of different passages there to, to look at that. Um, the government, we are to submit to the government unless the law is against God's law. For instance, in China recently, it was actually uh, ruled where the first commandment can no longer be um, presented in the church. Now, they're going to have to still teach it and still follow it, no matter what the government says, because God told them to live by that commandment. Um, secondly, uh, business. We work for the boss. We are not the boss. They are the boss. And we and remember, every all authority is borrowed. You might think, I wish that I was the boss, then I'd be the one in authority. It doesn't work like that. If you were the boss, then you'd have another boss. Everyone has a boss. And the pastor, he has a boss too. My boss is pastor. Pastor's boss is the district. The district's boss is the, um, the uh, it's called the general council. <laughs> the general council's boss is God. We all, as people, have borrowed authority. It's not our own. So then that takes us to church. There is a very clear church structure. You do not make the calls. You do not operate the church function. You um, you will get involved in ministry, and you do have, you know, obviously um, an opinion and a voice, and, and you're an important member of the church, and everybody um, should be kind of working together on stuff. Absolutely. But there's clear authority established in every situation um, and then in the family also there's um, there's Christ the husband the wife the child what we do is we get this all mixed up the wife doesn't respect the doesn't respect the husband the husband doesn't love and put the wife first um, the children don't listen to the parents and then and the children try to compensate by trying to be buddies bu buddy buddy with the children or it even exalt them where my life is about my kids no your life is not about your kids your life is about God your kids are an equal member of the household see just because someone has a different authority authoritative role in the house doesn't mean that they are worth more a husband and wife are both equal they both have an equal say in how the child is raised, in how the finances are spent, in whether or not they should move. The husband doesn't get to make those decisions by himself, but he is still the head of the household. Now, what does that mean? Well, for one, he is expected to put the wife first, even above the kids. He is expected to empty himself for their benefit. He's expected to sacrifice himself, to work. To, to, to put in the time and the effort and the money and the energy to make sure that his family is provided for. Well, I didn't sign up for that. That is the role of a husband. A husband is to kill himself for the sake of his wife and his children. That's what that role is. The wife is to respect the husband. The wife is to listen to the husband, to not make decisions behind his back. To do things in his absence as though he was still there. Don't do things conniving. To spend the money, once again, it's both of your money. Don't make big purchases without the spousal's knowledge and approval. Don't see what 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 sometimes people do is they abuse their authority. Well, I, the wife says, "I'm not going to go under my husband's authority," and the husband says, "I'm the leader of the household. I get to do whatever I want." And this is just not how it's supposed to be. All all members of a family are equal. They're all working towards a common goal of exalting God. But they all have different roles. The child does not make the call. You tell them when they go to bed. You tell them uh, You tell them on Sunday mornings to get up and go to church. You go to church with them. You lead them in their spiritual growth. Absolutely. So I hope that this kind of makes sense here. Because if you watch the news, if, if, if you're... If you're on social media, these basic structures of authority have just been completely neglected. And it's getting to the church where the church is oblivious to authority. And here's the thing. If you don't honor your authority, if you don't do the things that have your life structured as God commanded you, you will not see miracles. You will not see God using you. You will not grow spiritually. You will be stuck and not understanding things uh, in, in the Bible and in prayer. 
God works through authority. When you when you kind of separate yourself from the church and you refuse to, to just forgive people and let things go and, and you know, oh, I can't go to church because I've been hurt there. Or, you know, I can't go to church because I can't see eye to eye with the pastor or any other pastor. You know, when, when you start doing that, you separate yourself and you make it where you're more open to depression, you're more open to get stuck in harmful, like we talked about at the beginning, uh, harmful sins like pornography. Um, you're more apt to get, you know, in destructive situations. And here's the thing, God will judge you less when you submit yourself to your authority. Well, how does that work? It's like an umbrella that covers you. Now, you will still reap some of the some of the bad, but not if you would have opposed the, the authority. Let me show you what I mean, and we'll get to that in just a second. But what if, what if this happened? What if this, someone else's wrong doesn't justify your wrong? See, we think, if my spouse does something stupid, hey, I got a free ticket. I can do whatever I want. That's not how it works. Some people say happy wife, happy life. No, no, happy spouse, happy life. The husband is to love and serve the wife. The wife is to respect and honor the husband. This is a, it's a two-way street. So don't justify your sin. Don't say, hey, it's okay for me to sin because of fill in the blank. So let's look at your sheet here. The first fill in the blank at the top was finances. Under the three basic purposes for authority, the first fill in the blank is character, and the second one is temptations, and the third one is receive clear direction. And on four basic structures of authority, the third one, or I mean the first one, is church. And so that takes us to what will happen if you rebel. Your children lose inheritance. Inheritance. God plans something for them that they will lose because of your action. Well, you might say, well, that's not fair. Our actions always affect people, whether we like it or not. Your children will lose their inheritance. Your ministry and your witness will suffer. You, God will definitely remove you from a position of authority. You will definitely not have things work out as well. There's been a lot of people who um, that I have actually seen this happen to where you know they were doing good and then they just couldn't get under the pastor's authority and so they opposed him on everything and eventually they got out of church now they don't go to any church now they sit at home telling themselves how they're right and how everybody else is wrong they don't grow they don't witness to any, anybody they're back in their same temptations they drink again they smoke again they have drugs in the house again they you know things like that and that's just the way of what happens when we rebel it's not like it should be a real big surprise to us. Your life will be shortened. You reject God's blessing and experience rocky paths. Things just don't go as well. You raise yourself against God in pride, and God will not watch out for you like he did before. He, he still loves you, but he will not bless you in your rebellion. Your spiritual life begins to die. You lose your authority over others. Hear me on that. You lose your authority over others. If you're talking about it about cops, don't be surprised if your kids talk bad about you. Don't be surprised that they do whatever you do to an increased amount. Well, I hate my parents, but my kids are just going to love me. Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe you're going to have a huge problem on your hands. Rebellion allows for demonic activity in the household. It's just not good. It's not good. So what is my obligation to authority? All the, okay, you've said all these things. I get that. I get that. Now, now what, what am I expected to do? First... You're expected to obey them. Once again, if you're 30, respecting and honoring your parents doesn't necessarily mean always obeying them. Consider what they say, but at 30, you're kind of just, you need to start making your own decisions as an adult. Um, but you do still need to respect and honor them and listen to them when they talk and consider what they say. Uh, but if you are a teenager, yes, you are very much so under your parents' household. If you are in a divorce situation, whoever has custody, they are your authority, and if they are, have a relationship with someone, they are also your authority. But um, you are only expected to obey them so long as it doesn't go against God. For instance, let's say your mom has a boyfriend who wants to have sexual activity with you. There's nothing that says you have to do that. Absolutely not. In fact, you should let your mom know. You should let the authorities know. Get help. Do not stay in such a destructive environment. That is a terrible idea, and it will end poorly. Um, do whatever you can to get free. Absolutely. Oof. When I'm saying these things, this is how a typical structure should go. But when I'm saying obey them, I'm not saying I'm not saying subject yourself to rape, subject yourself to, to, to violence. I'm not I'm not saying those things at all. 
Um, so we're talking about in, in a typical authority role here. Um, obey them so long as it doesn't dis disagree with God. Pray for their well-being. That is one of the most important things you can ever do for authority. Control your thoughts, actions, and words to be of benefit to them. Not to harm them. Work for their best interest. Talk for their best interest. Want their best interest. Do not say or think cutting remarks. Do not, do not want evil for them. Do not wish evil on them. Do not harbor resentment. Do not harbor resentment. you got to let stuff go and grow. Um, pastor, okay, so let me just, let me see if I want to get to that yet. I'll come back to that. Okay, so what about the, the pastor? Now, this is how authority goes in the church. Christ is the head of the church. It's his church. It's not the pastor's church. It's his church. Oh, well, that's Randy's church. No, this is not Randy's church. This is Christ's church. And if you ask pastor, he'll say the exact same thing. When he's dead and gone, he does not want anybody to remember this as Randy's church because it wasn't Randy's church. And I'm positive that whoever the next pastor is, if they're really a man of God, it won't be their church either. So let's talk, let's talk about that, okay? So it's Christ's church. That's absolutely important to understand. So then Christ appoints certain people to certain jobs. It's their authority. So that takes us to the pastor who was appointed by God. Okay, the pastor is not there for entertainment. We do not go on Sunday morning and, hey, that was an entertaining message. He is not there for us to judge. We do not critique his performance. It's not an entertainment. Okay, it is also not a dictatorship. Okay, he was voted in and he is expected to hold to Christian standards. He's not a, he's, he's not he's not supposed to be cheating on his wife, he's not supposed to be looking at pornography, he's not supposed to be committing murder, stealing from people, etc., etc., etc. That is the role of a pastor. Um, but when he, once he is voted in, which he has been, it is our job to get involved in ministry ourselves, to honor him, to, to provide for him financially so that he can watch over the church as Christ has appointed him. But it's not a dictatorship. Um, he is not, pastors are not allowed to, for instance, um, govern your life decisions. Well, I was going to move, but I need to run it by my pastor. What? Most opposition to the pastor has to do with the preference and bias, your own traditions. The pastor not doing things that you like, not, you don't, you're, you're not getting your way. It has little to do with church function, the majority of the time. Now, there are some pastors who do get involved in sin, and that does need to be dealt with, absolutely, but not based off the uh, opinions of one person. Like, give me, let me give you an example. Sometimes people accuse that a pastor, make an accusation that a pastor has done something that he hasn't. And for that, there needs to be at least two witnesses or some kind of proof or something. So uh, the pastor doesn't dictate life decisions. He gives you spiritual guidance. He, he roots out uh, false teachings in the church. He helps you to get involved in ministry. He, you know, is there for um, counseling and that kind of stuff. Absolutely. We are a team and the leader needs support. Okay? Think of it like soccer. He's the coach. We are the um, the team. Never compare the current pastor with the previous pastor negatively or positively. This is absolutely de devastating for a pastor. Not just that, it's just hurtful for the previous and the past pastor. That's just a bad idea. You have to realize that you will never have that old pastor back again. If you've had a different pastor and, and you have to welcome a new one, it sucks, but you got to move on. And you're never going to be able to stay at that at that church with that pastor for forever. Eventually, you will have to go to a new pastor or a new church. Maybe you move, whatever. You do not have authority over the pastor. He has authority over you. Do not oppose him because then he has to has to bring church discipline. Know what I mean? Oftentimes, it can result in you losing a ministry and you not being considered for further ministries, and you being excused from the church, uh, kicked out. Um, there's been some people who uh, pastors told them, you are more than welcome to come back, but you have to come back through my office, and after we've had a chat, and I've made sure that you're not going to destroy the church, then you can come back. See, there are some people who have to be kicked out of the church because they are like a cancer. They hurt the other church members, and as a pastor, we unfortunately have that very hard, difficult task of bringing that discipline about. So there are some people that we will not let in because it will actually hurt other people. So 
uh, moving back on here, you don't have authority over the pastor, he has authority over you. Um, you just because you pay tithes doesn't mean that you get to run how he runs affairs. Um, if a pastor is abusing authority by being immoral, friends can say things better than acquaintances can, and if you won't listen and it's of actual sin and it's a big deal, then you would take it to the district. Um, we are a part of the Assemblies of God, so you would take to the district and say this pastor is doing so-and-so, and then they would do an investigation, and whatever is best for the church, the, the, um, they would decide on. But if you're just trying to start up a problem, remember that God will remember that. And God really doesn't like it when you try to destroy the church. God really doesn't like it when you oppose the people that he has appointed. Don't, don't, uh, don't forget that. So what if I can't stop presenting them? What if I just really don't like them and I can't get over it? There's a few things. First off, pray daily. Stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. A lot of times, we will have a problem with something, like getting into occultic behavior or whatever, because we have backed up, backed off, because we have backed off in serving God. And the truth is, when we are in times of kind of distancing ourselves from God and not listening to God like we should, um, excuse me, um, we are more open to uh, Satan's just excuse me, destructive influences. So, pray daily. Get back on God's page. Fast. Apologize to them for your attitude. I have had a sorry attitude. I, I'm really sorry. My, my attitude is inexcusable. Um, apologize to them for your attitude. Think about other things. Sometimes we resent them because we can't stop thinking about this thing in our head that's either real or imagined, either or. Um, memorize scripture. Memorize scripture that talks about it. Memorize scripture about honoring authority. These are all great ideas. Don't hang around anyone that shares your negative views. If there's someone that you know is just waiting to talk about the pastor or waiting to talk about, about bad about the president or whatever, don't hang around them. Just don't. 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 <laughs> don't hang around anyone that shares your negative views because it's just going to suck you right back in. This takes us back to the gossiping, gossiping and complaining bit. Um, you support them for your own good. If you look on your sheet there, that's the fill in the blank. You support them for your own good. Never side against authority. Never side against authority. It's gonna first off, it's gonna hurt them. It's gonna hurt you. It's gonna hurt others. Don't be don't don't be that selfish person who just is trying to prove a point. Um, never side against authority. Um, and especially as a Christian, if there's ever a situation where um, there is a, a revolution or a revolt going on in America. Don't, don't get too involved in that. Um, you don't want to do something that is going to a cause people to not get saved. I think is really the the root of all that. And it's good to stand up for you know social rights and those kinds of things. But a lot of times people just get caught up in movements and they get caught up in things that really have no benefit. You see it happened with the Crusades, you see it happened with a lot of different stuff. So, anyways, never listen to or agree with someone who is bad-mouthing authority. Um, I remember one time somebody was bad-mouthing the pastor because we had this huge, obnoxious wooden pulpit. It was terrible. It was huge. It was ugly. It came from probably the 1800s, if I had to guess. I mean, that was the ugliest pulpit in the world. So we did what any self-respecting pastor should do. We got rid of that hunk of crap, and we got a nice new pulpit. And uh, there it sat in the uh, uh, offices because we were waiting to, to move it out. And a, uh, a person went in the office, and they started complaining about the decision and how the pastor was this terrible person for it. And they started complaining to a uh, church leader, and the church leader actually uh, started agreeing with them. And so here we have this huge thing of gossip and backbiting, and the church is not supposed to work like that. If you are in any kind of leadership, you need to have the pastor's back, and you need to not give an ear to anyone who is just gossiping and complaining. Okay? You might think, well, it's my ministry to, to help people through their complaints. It is not your, your ministry to listen to gossip and complaining. You tell them, we don't talk about, we don't talk about the pastor behind his back. We don't talk like that. We, that. That's not what we do here. If you want to be somewhere who gossips and complain, you need to find somewhere else to go. We don't do that here. 
that is your responsibility as a church member is to not allow gossiping and complaining. The church is absolutely the church's future is dependent on not gossiping and complaining. It's dependent on that. So this is what's going to happen if you gossip and complain, and if you oppose the pastor. This is what's going to happen. First off, you're going to lose any future at that church. Second off, you're going to get real self-righteous and prideful. You're going to probably pull away from people and sit in your house and think about how you're right and how everybody else is wrong. You're going to think that you're the overseer, that you it's your job to keep an eye on everything and to make sure everybody does what you think. It just never ends well. I have never once seen somebody um, listen to or agree with someone who is bad-mouthing authority and end up well. I've never once seen that. Even if we're talking about politics. Even that kind of authority. So people sit there and they and they talk and they get all heated up and nothing changes. So really, all that they've done is cause themselves more irritation. So this is kind of right here on the on the screen, is what it looks like um, when you are submitted to authority. The prideful who want to live their own way. This that's this guy over here. He doesn't have an authority an umbrella over him. He doesn't have authority in his life. He lives however he thinks is best. Now here's the harmful tempt temptation situations and attacks. Here's authority. Here's somebody happily under authority. Here's somebody who's can, who can get under somebody else's authority, and here they are. Here's a new father who submitted to his own father. See, when we do things like oppose our, 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 our parents and make life hell for them and just make decisions just to piss them off, it will affect our future. And even when we, when we repent, there will still be things that we have to deal with because of our decisions. So, uh, now I'm not saying that nothing bad will ever happen, but I will say that things that would have happened won't. No matter how bad you have it, you would have had it worse if you would have gone against authority. What causes bad attitudes towards authority? Three things. For, first off, pride. We saw this with Satan, thinking that you know, you're better or you know better or whatever. Misunderstanding. We saw this with Adam and Eve, that they, they thought that, hey, I have, I have the right answer. I, you know, I... Uh, I never thought about that. Maybe if we eat of this fruit, things will be better. We start reasoning and instead of just listening to the authority. And the third, a wounded spirit. Wounded spirit is the um, is the uh, fill in the blank. They're wounded. We see this with teenagers. Sometimes our teen our kids will uh, reject us and whatnot because they're hurt. And hurt people hurt people. So uh, really make sure that. Um, you address these things in yourselves. First off, misunderstanding. Remember, you're not you're not the boss. Uh, uh, remember, pride that you need to humble yourself and wounded spirit. You need to forgive and let go. Now, so let's look at some definitions when we talk about authority. Submit. What does it mean to submit to? It means give way to. You are giving way to the other person or to God. Um, honor. To honor means to think highly of. You are to honor your mother and father think highly of them you don't always have to do everything that they say but even if you don't do what they say it needs to be with the spirit of honor um, respect what does respect mean respect is to treat with exception you are treating them with exception you respect them um, okay uh, this would be you don't talk bad about your parents. You don't talk bad about your parents to their faces. You don't sit and criticize everything they did. You don't sit and whine and complain about how you weren't a very good parent to me. Let it go. You're an adult now and you need to let it go and move on. Okay, so uh, pride, what does pride mean? Pride means refusing to submit to God's ways. It means having an attitude of superiority. I am smarter than you. I am more advanced than you. I'm more spiritual than you. I know what to do and you don't. Um, I'm closer to God than you. Um, I don't need God. These are all examples of pride. So refusing to repent. Pride, prideful people usually do refuse to repent, and people who refuse to repent usually become prideful. Um, having pleasure in self. These are all good uh, examples. Um, having an unteachable spirit. You cannot be told anything. You just know. You know everything. Um, trusting in self. I don't need that. I'm basically good anyways. I was right. Trusting in hurt. I don't go to church because a hypocrite there hurt me. Um, another example of pride, trusting in the thing. Doctors can heal me. Well, yeah, you know, it's good to go to the doctor and all that, but remember that God is the ultimate decider of whether we live and die. And so it's probably best to put our trust in God, but still go to the doctor. 
So these are just three areas right here of, of pride. Trusting in self, trusting in the hurt, trusting in the thing, rather than submitting it to God. So I hope you understand that. Let me run through that one more time. I, the areas of pride is, is trusting and not in God. So if I'm trusting in myself, I think that I'm, I'm good, I'm better than other people. If I'm trusting in my hurt, I'm trusting in my wounded spirit, I don't go to church because a the hypocrite there hurt me. You know, I, 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 I'm too prideful. Or trusting in the thing. Doctors can heal me. So there is a, a type of humility that some people think that they are humble because they have this, and it's called false humility. Basically, it focuses on one's own failures or inabilities. And if you look on your sheet, comparing yourself to others. I'm such a worm. I'm just so sinful and wicked I don't know how anyone could love me. That's not humility. That's false humility. Well, most of us think that that's being humble. So what is true humility? Humility is being able to be taught something, listening when people, ha when people talk, being modest, not bragging, for instance, um, to see others as more important than yourself, to give way to another. To compare oneself to Christ and to define yourself as the Bible says you are. That is humility. And if we spend too much time talking about how evil and corrupt we are and woe is me, I'm such a worm, we will not be able to become humble because then we're going to start being prideful in our um, sin and in our failure. So how do we repent of pride? This is how we overcome it by and by grace we overcome that sin by grace um, we often put pride in ourselves our abilities and our hurt even as christians pride dries up grace in our life and god gives us grace to act right and so when we even as christians put and have pride it dries up that grace and god will kind of be aloof okay so how do we get more grace then if we have been prideful and we've dried up the source of grace well the first thing and this is a fill in the blank on that un under repenting of pride submit to god he alone is sovereign he is the ruler of your life he decides what goes and that's how it goes second submit uh, i'm sorry uh, resist the devil decide not to sin before you are tempted and intercede for authority pray for authority okay but then also decide not to sin before you're tempted see sometimes we go through life and it's like we're not even expecting it. So then something happens and we just go to pieces. Why is God letting this happen? Why? Did, because you are in a battle for your very soul, for your very life. Your enemy is like a lion. He's waiting to tear you to pieces. So expect the battle. Look and expect forward for a battle to come. And then decide I'm not going to cave before you even get there. I am done looking at pornography. That's just the way of it. So now, okay, your wife leaves. You're home alone with the internet. What are you going to do? Well, I made the commitment that I'm not going to do this. So I'm going to leave the house too. I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, okay, so submit to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to God. Um, see God in light of your failures. See, sometimes we think, well, I'm just too bad to see God. But no, no, no. Use that failure as an opportunity to see God. Cleanse your hands of sin. These are all from James. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, cleanse your hands of sin. Cease action and get rid of possessions of impurity. Okay, let me let me break this down. Stop sinning. Um, if you have things in your house like a Ouija board, get rid of it. Resolve conflicts. Stop gossiping. Stop opposing authority. These are. This is how you cleanse your hands. And this, once again, is in James chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 10. And uh, purify your hearts of double-mindedness. Well, what does that mean? Do you really want to hate sin? Weigh it and decide. Is this really what I want or is this not what I want? And then do that. The proud have chosen both the praise and the methods of the world and are acting as God's enemies. When we are proud... We are lifting ourselves up against God. We are acting as his enemies. We make ourselves an enemy of God. The proud by nature do things contrary to God's ways, and by nature they go to destruction. But then also God puts a curse on uh, those who are his enemies. The humble man does things God's ways. 
See, sometimes we remember that God is love, but then we fail to take into account that God is also God. And he deserves that honor. He deserves that respect. And there is a certain amount of fearing the Lord that goes along with it. When we reject our authority, God brings others by to teach us. So, okay, I don't go to church anymore, whatever. So then God brings by this other person that annoys us. And we can either soften our heart or harden our heart. We see the exact same thing happen in Exodus with the Pharaoh. Pharaoh was prideful, so God brought by Moses. And he got more prideful. And so then God brought miracles and signs and wonders and all kinds of things, and Pharaoh got more prideful. So then finally he lets him go, and he decides to chase Moses down uh, towards the river, and he dies. So when we reject our authority, God brings others by to teach us. A spouse that says what a mom or dad used to, for instance, have you ever been married to somebody and uh, you, maybe you didn't have your parents' blessing on who you got married to, you just kind of had to get married to whoever you thought was better? And uh, then your spouse starts saying and doing things like, just like your parents did. And, ooh, that, that, that hurts. I don't like this. And so then what do we do? We divorce them because, hey, they're getting, on, they're getting on my nerves. This person is getting on my nerves because they remind me of my parents who I never learned to deal with. Um, so just a, th a few things here. Don't do things which aren't in your authority to do. The blank there is authority. The pastor doesn't write speeding tickets. Don't, for instance, uh, so as that applies to church, don't stick your fingers where they don't belong. Don't stick your fingers where they don't belong. Don't always feel like you have to intervene between your kids and your spouse. Don't feel like you always have to um, contradict uh, your spouse or contradict the pastor or contradict the, the, the president or whatever. Before you do, ask, who is an authority? See, in America, we, have, we don't have like kings. We have people who are elected. And we need to remind them that they have been elected because they work for us. However, there is a certain amount of authority that goes with that office. We elected them, and then they have authority. That's how that works. So what people do, they did it with President Obama. They're doing it with President Trump. Oh, that's not my, my president. Well, yes, actually, he is our president. You may not like him as the president, but he is the president. Um, before you do, ask, who is an authority? Is this really an area that I have uh, dominion over don't ask why they're an authority. Never ask why are they an authority because that's the that is the um, the heart of someone who rejects authority. You start just asking why are they an authority? Why are they an authority? And before you know it, it spreads. You have problems in your sp with your spouse, with your with the pastor, etc. So when authority makes you angry or uncomfortable, uncomfortable, submit yourself to God's scalpel. The fill in the blank there is scalpel. See, God is trying to work something into you, and he loves you too much to leave you in sin. Is there ever a reason to disobey authority? Ooh, that's, that's hard. That is hard. Um, and I will say yes if it's not done with the spirit of rebellion. And, and if you know what I mean, sometimes we're just rebellious. We just, we just don't like being under somebody else's thumb. Let me give you a story, though. A boy felt God calling him to Bible school, but his father advised him not to go. Should he go? Should he disobey his father? See, God doesn't war against himself. He makes a way. God is the one who gave authority to that father, and the father made the call. So here's the thing. God is leading that father in growth the same as he's leading the son. Now, what should happen is the son should, should submit himself to what the father said and do what the father said. See, this is God's hammer of authority. He uses either, um, let me let me say this differently. This is God's hammer and this is God's chisel. Um, this can be either authority, our circumstances, our finances, whatever. Something that God is using to work in us. And here's the chisel, which is also authority, circumstances, finances, whatever, which God is using to work in us. And then this is you. He's trying to make you into diamond. So, number one, emotions and feelings never take supremacy over authority. We looked at that at the beginning of the, of the lesson. Here was authority, and here was conscience. Uh, number two, God placed the father in authority, and if he really wanted the boy to go, he would change the father's heart. And remember, the father is still growing in faith, the same as the son is, even if the father isn't a Christian. Number three, God will also answer with finances. Did the boy have the money to go to Bible school without school loans? Number four, God wants to work character in the boy through his father. 
God wants to work character in the boy. See, the, the father may have seen something, a lacking character trait in the boy that needed to be addressed. And then going back to number three, we convince ourselves that we should do something that's not biblical. God, for instance, said, hey, don't get into debt. It's a bad idea. But we say, eh, I'm not going to listen to that. And we get ourselves in school debt, and then we have a bunch of debt that we can't pay off. So, I mean, eh, let's remember that. The father realized that the son's attitude of ungratefulness and stubbornness would cause him to fail in ministry. Responding correctly will begin to change the boy's character. And the father wanted the boy to get a real degree so that if the ministry didn't work, he would have a fallback. That's actually a good idea because a lot of pastors have to work outside jobs outside of the church because their church is either too small or whatever. The father didn't want the boy not, to not have a retirement plan. He wanted the best for the boy, but because the boy was so stubborn, he couldn't see that. Realizing our authority's motivation for their action causes us to appreciate them and respond with patience and love. Try to understand why your authority is being like this. If even Jesus submitted to his authority, just God himself, why shouldn't you? And I'm not just talking about where it says he, he did the will of the Father. I'm talking about where it says um, he submitted himself to his earthly mother and father um, in Luke. So is there ever a reason to obey authority? Let's look at this again. If it goes against God, if it is an immoral thing. We see this in the book of Daniel. If you do it without a rebellious attitude, um, and it has to be done, obviously. Most disobedience is from having a rebellious heart, not accepting the president, the pastor, your spouse, your parent. It's not for legitimate reasons. Your authority does have to, uh, doesn't have to be perfect for you to honor them. See, we think if they make a stake, mistake, that means I don't have to honor them. That's not what the Bible says. So I hope that this has all made sense here. The film blank there, uh, the last one. When we reject our authority, God brings others by to teach us, like our spouses. Um, if you have any questions, please post them below. This is the last lesson of this class. I hope that it has been beneficial. I hope that you've learned and grown. John 5.19 says, Therefore Jesus, an um, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Authority is for our benefit, not for our curse. Um, so that is the end. Congratulations. You have done a mighty thing. Don't, don't, uh, don't hesitate at all to look back and watch past lessons again. Read all the scriptures that I wrote down uh, on your sheets. Um, think about the things, really genuinely think about the things, um, and challenge yourself to grow.